أَحْبَانُهُمْ فَإِنَّهُمْ غَيْرُ مَلُومِينَ فَمَنِ ابْتَغَى وَرَاءَ ذَلِكَ فَأُولَئِكَ هُمُ الْعَادُونَ وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِأَمَانَاتِهِمْ وَعَهْدِهِمْ رَاعُونَ والذين هم على صلواتهم يحافظون أولئك هم الوارثون الذين يرثون الفردوس هم فيها خالدون ولقد خلقنا الإنسان من سلالة من طين ثم جعلناه نطفة في قرار مكين ثم خلقنا النطفة علقة فخلقنا العلقة مضغة فخلقنا المضغة عظاما فخلقنا المضغة عظاما فكسونا العظام لحما ثم أنشأناه خلقا آخر فتبارك الله أحسن الخالقين ثم إنكم بعد ذلك لميتون ثم إنكم يوم القيامة تبعثون السلام عليكم Peace be with you. I would like to welcome you on behalf of the Islamic Society of the University of East Anglia. Today, we have the pleasure of having Sheikh Shabir Ali, who has come especially from Toronto, Canada, to speak to us. The subject of this evening lecture is Mathematical Miracles in the Quran. And this is the first of a series of three lectures which we hope will be very interesting and illuminating. These lectures are part of the first Islam awareness event on this campus, which is intended to improve understanding of Islam and to show how it is and to show how it can contribute positively academically, culturally, culturally and socially. And this is, we intend to attract both to the university and to the wider community around knowledge. I would like to say a few words of introduction about Sheikh Shabir Ali. Shabir Ali hails from the other side of the Atlantic where he lives with his wife and four children. He is the president of the Islamic Information and Dawah Center International based in Toronto, Canada. He has a BA in Religious Studies from Laurent Shan University in Canada. He is currently completing his master's degree with the Department of the Study of Religion at the University of Toronto. Brother Ali has said for many years as Imam and public speaker of Islam, he appears as a regular guest on a weekly television podcast in Canada called Let the Quran Speak. He has represented Islam in many interfaith dialogues and debates. He has had fruitful dialogues with Dr. Joel Marcus and others. He has also debated with Dr. John Warwick Montgomery and the scholar of international repute, Dr. William Lane Craig. Shabir will, inshallah, speak for an hour. After this, there will be time for questions and answers. Before asking Brother Shabir to come in, just I would like to mention that there are two exits, one from the right side and left side, if anything's emergency occur. So uh, we would like to welcome Brother Shabir. So please, oh, Brother Shabir, come in. Thank you. Thank you very much for that warm introduction. Now, the Quran has been studied for more than a thousand years. 
people have responded variously to the Qur'an. Some have responded with belief, some have responded with disbelief. In fact, the Qur'an indicates already that this will be the case. The Qur'an says that uh, by this very book, God will guide many, and by the same book, God will allow many to go astray. It seems that the book itself will give reason uh, for some people to uh, turn away from belief in God. It will become a cutting edge for people. In the Arabic language, we have a word called fitna, and this word is used to describe the action of uh, testing uh, a metal in fire. So the good one comes out well and the bad one uh, doesn't do so well. So in a similar way, it seems that people will read the Quran, some will come away from it with belief, and some will come away from it with disbelief. In our modern times, uh, many people are turning away from scriptures in general, and many are finding good reasons uh, for disbelieving in all scriptures. But uh, it is interesting that uh, even in our modern age, Muslims continue to take the Quran very seriously. People who are educated in a variety of fields, they may be engineers, doctors, uh, what have you, uh, may also, in fact, take a very active interest in the Quran. Uh, a PhD in a variety of subjects may also be a memorizer of the entire Quran. So why is it then that the Quran continues to hold such uh, an attraction uh, for Muslims? Well, there are many reasons. Uh, many have found, in fact, that in reading the Quran, even today, the Quran turns out to be a reasonable book that could be respected, that uh, could be uh, followed even in our present time. Uh, more to the point, people have studied the Quran from a variety of angles, using their own fields of interests uh, to guide them in studying the book. So people look for things that are of interest to them given their own particular fields. If someone sells shoes, so one of the first things they do is look at your shoes. And if uh, someone sells computers, when they come into your room, that's the first thing they'll notice, what sort of computer you have. So people with the varieties of interests have looked at the Quranic text and they have found uh, things of interest to them. In particular, people who are scientists have found that the Quran has much to say regarding their own field. It seems that the Quran is describing uh, a variety of physical observable phenomena and uh, these uh, descriptions are of great interest to people who have a scientific background. A book written uh, 1400 years ago, as the Quran certainly was, uh, would be expected to reflect the ideas of its day and would hardly be expected to coincide uh, with the modern scientific discoveries. And yet the Quran seems to do exactly that. There are statements in the Quran which, uh, it put in a simple manner, would have been understood at a basic level by the first addressees of the Quran. And at the same time, these uh, same simple expressions uh, seem to hint at knowledge which scientists are only now discovering. Now, it is not my subject tonight to go into details of all of these uh, scientific uh, uh, cor correspondences or correspondence or correlation between Quranic statements and modern scientific discoveries. Uh, I want to focus more on the use of numbers in the Quran. But uh, I'll just give you a couple of quick examples. First, uh, from the idea that the universe is expanding. As you know, this is a firmly held modern theory. It has been in place since 1964, and it seems hardly likely that this will be shifted. In fact, at first, this was resisted when it was first suggested in the late 1920s, when Edwin Hubble uh, turned his telescope uh, into the night sky, he saw that all of the stars and galaxies are moving away from each other at rapid speed. And uh, to him there was uh, one very good explanation for this, that the universe is expanding. And when I helped my kids with uh, science fair experiments uh, some years ago, I came across an analogy that uh, would help to explain this very easily. What they've explained in some of these science fair textbooks is that if you take a balloon, a child's balloon, and you use a ballpoint pen to put a number of dots on it, and then you blow into the balloon, the dots will each move apart from every other dot. And uh, the, reasons for the, the reason for the dots moving apart from each other, or away from each other, is the very fact that this, the space that contains them is somehow expanding. The balloon is expanding. So in a similar sense, uh, the universe is expanding, 
and that uh, explains what Hubble had observed. But the idea that the universe is expanding was uh, resisted by scientists uh, for uh, many decades, because if they admit that the universe is expanding, they will have to think back to a time when the universe was nothing. And if the universe was nothing, then the question uh, remains what gave rise to the universe. There would be no scientific explanation for that, and we would have to turn to religion and philosophy uh, for an explanation of the origin of all things. Uh, Einstein worked into his equ equations what he called a cosmological constant uh, to make it pretend that uh, the universe is not expanding after all. And uh, later on, he looked back at that as uh, his uh, greatest uh, blunder. So the universe is in fact expanding and it was in 1964 that Penzias and Wilson won the Nobel Prize for their discovery of what is called cosmic background microwave uh, radiation. That uh, proved once and for all uh, that uh, the universe is expanding because what they discovered was the remains, the radiation from that initial Big Bang explosion. And now, what if we find that the Quran already seems to hint at uh, the expansion of the universe? In Surah 51, verse number 47, it says, As for the universe, we have created it with power, and we are expanding it. Now, this uh, was not quite understandable to early commentators. Some said that uh, it is uh, obvious that this means that God is uh, putting more provisions into the earth or into the, into the heavens. But, uh, of course, uh, now we can see that uh, it has a meaning that co coincides with our modern scientific discoveries. The universe, indeed, is expanding. Now, if that uh, is something quite big, what about something quite small and microscopic? The growth and development of the human embryo is a fascinating subject. And whether the Quran is speaking about the universe in general uh, or the human being in particular and his place in that universe, the Quran's point is not to describe any of these, but uh, to give us guidance. It is not a book of science uh, to tell us how the heavens go, but it is a book uh, of religion to tell us how to go to heaven. Uh, so its, its main point is to stress uh, our uh, humble uh, position before the majestic creator of all of these things. And so to remind us of our you know, position, the Quran often calls our attention to our humble beginnings. Uh, we developed from a tiny drop and that uh, grew into a thing that clings and then into a chewed lump. It, it is uh, interesting that the Arabic words for these various uh, stages of growth and development, while uh, reflecting the very earliest stages that could not be studied without the help of a microscope, correspond precisely to modern scientific descriptions. In fact, Dr. Keith Moore, uh, from uh, my city in Toronto, uh, it has written textbooks that are studied in universities throughout the Western world on the subject of embryology. And he has uh, proposed in one of his writings that the Quranic terminology should replace uh, some of the scientific terminology that, are, that have been used uh, for the various uh, stages of human growth. Uh, so accurate, he finds, are the Quranic uh, descriptions of uh, the various stages. Uh, now, I don't want to go into all of the details of this because that itself will be a separate lecture. But just to give you a feel of the broader subject area that we're dealing with, what we are finding that uh, the Quran corresponds in many ways uh, to uh, discoveries of a modern sort in a way that is surprising and interesting to modern people. So whether or not you're a believer in the Quran or whether you come away from all of this believing or not, it doesn't make any difference. It is important uh, that uh, we listen, uh, that we learn, that we study for ourselves and find out uh, whether or not there is a whole new different area here uh, of study that will lend more support to the idea that the Quran, in fact, uh, is uh, a book of divine origin. Now, the Quran was uh, compiled into writing some 1400 years ago. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was born in the year 570, and he began receiving uh, revelations from God in the year 610. He continued to receive revelations uh, a bit at a time, little segments, little portions, few lines at a time, maybe longer portions, uh, for the next 22 to 23 years until he finally passed away. 
Within two years after his death, traditional reports have it that his successor uh, prepared a compilation uh, from all of the available written materials that were dictated by him during his lifetime, dictated by the Prophet during his lifetime, and uh, also corroborated with uh, the memorizers who had uh, memorized the Quran uh, during the Prophet's uh, time. And so we have that book then eventually copied and sent to various parts of the Muslim empire during the time of the third caliph of Islam. Now the third caliph uh, reigned from the year 12 to 24. So within the years 12 to 24, standard copies of the Quran were prepared and sent to various parts of the Muslim empire. Today, the Quran that we're re reading the world over is based on those copies that were sent to various parts of the Muslim world. We have made improvements to the text to make it easier to recite uh, correctly. Uh, the Arabic text was written without vowels. And to complicate matters further, there are look-alike Arabic letters that were not distinguished from each other. If we have a piece of writing in English uh, handwriting, and we did not dot the I's and cross the T's, you can appreciate that I's will start to look like T's, and perhaps also like L's. In the Arabic language, the way it was initially written, uh, letters looked like other letters. So later on, scholars put in dots and markers to distinguish letters from, an, from one from another, and they put in vowels so that the untrained reader will know precisely how to recite the text, even if one does not even understand the language. And so improvements to the text have been made to make the text uh, more legible, more readable to one who is uninitiated. But the basic skeleton of that text has remained unchanged, and with Muslims to this day in all of our texts. It is interesting that now, when we study this book, we find that there are correspondences of things. We're not looking so much at the meaning of things now, but we're looking at the count of things in the Quran. And we're finding that, in fact, uh, the count of things show a mind behind the Quran. Let me give you some examples of what, what I mean, more to the point. Let's have a look. Suppose we ask uh, if there are certain antonyms uh, in the Quran. Uh, opposites to each other, and we ask how many times are the words used. Now, if we wanted to do this on, on our own, and we wanted to write something, and we want the antonyms to be an equal number of times one with each other, then we can use them all together, and just uh, that will be the easiest thing. If we want to use man and woman the same number of times, we can just mention man and woman, man and woman. You know, I saw a man and a woman, and the man said to the woman, and each time we mention man, we make sure we mention woman. And that will make sure, I'm just giving you some background information about some of the uh, basis uh, for the study. Those who are interested can take note of that and how to verify the information. Those who are readers of Arabic can check the book by Fuad Abdul Baki. But now, let's uh, look at what the Quran has done in fact. The Quran has used uh, words which are antonyms of each other or words which are interesting in relation to each other and has not used them together in the same place, but has used them in a manner that is scattered throughout the book. So for example, the Quran tells us that Jesus, who is known as Isa in the Quran, is like Adam. In the Masala Isa in the Allahi Kamathali Adam. Jesus in the eyes of God is like Adam. Now, my point is not so much in, in in, in the whole meaning of that, because Muslims will then go on to explain that just as God created Adam, God also created Jesus. They are both creatures before God, and that's the Quran's main point. But isn't it interesting to also find out that Jesus is mentioned 25 times in the Quran, and also Adam is mentioned 25 times in the Quran. And so by looking at the Quran from this unique perspective, we are seeing, in fact, another way in which uh, Jesus is like Adam. They're both mentioned in the Quran an equal number of times because in the eyes of God, Jesus is like Adam. That's quite interesting. Now, it doesn't have to be so. If it wasn't like that, no one would complain. But the fact that it is like that uh, it gives us uh, a, a unique view uh, on the Quran. It, should, it seems like the Quran is, is put together by some sort of plan. 
And uh, in fact, no human being knew about this plan until we're discovering it now. And that seems to point then towards a divine mind. Mind. Man and woman. Each mentioned in the Quran and, uh, 24 times. 24 times for Rajul, man in the singular, and also for Imra'a, Arabic, for woman in the singular. Uh, and we find they're a perfect match. Now, shaitan or Satan, uh, in our, uh, as is given in, in the Arabic, and angel, malaika, is used uh, in the Quran, both words, an equal number of times. And again, they're not used together. So for one to do what the Prophet Muhammad did, reciting bits and pieces of the Quran over a period of 23 years, uh, he would have to remember uh, about that last bit. How, much, how many times have I mentioned Satan already? And how many times have I mentioned angel already? Keep a very close tab of it and make sure that he's getting both of them 68 times. Now, the num number gets larger and more difficult, of course, to keep tab of uh, when we look at dunya and akhira. Dunya is the word for this life, this world, this side of the grave, and akhira for the other side, the life hereafter. Dunya and akhira are each used in the Quran 115 times. Now, what accounts for this perfect correspondence then between these two um, antonyms? Now, land and sea... Uh, are, are interesting. They're always compared in the Quran. Um, well, for the number of times that in fact they seem to occur together. But they don't always occur together, as we will see, because uh, sea is mentioned many, many more times than land. But the, the number of times that dry land, um, bar is mentioned, or, or yabis, uh, is uh, uh, 13 times. Uh, but it is compared also with sea. Zahar al fasaruk al barri wal bahri bi baqasabat aydin nas. Corruption has occurred on land and sea because of what human hands have wrought. Uh, so land and sea are compared. And here we find that land is mentioned 13 times and sea is mentioned 32 times. Now it turns out that 13 to 32 is the approximate ratio of land to water on the surface of our globe since there's about 72% water. Now that, that's a very interesting correspondence. Now, month, I don't know who's doing that. <laughs> month is mentioned in the singular in the Quran in uh, uh, exactly 12 times. And uh, there is a dual form in the Arabic Shahrain uh, for two months, which is mentioned 30 times, as if the the author of the Quran uh, has in mind the, the, uh, the, the fact that all of these numbers mean something when it comes to month. So there are 12 months in the year, there are 30 days in a month. And then, my kids must have done that to me. <laughs> it is interesting that uh, the, the word day in, in Arabic, yawm, in the singular, as mentioned in the Quran a number of times that is, uh, that is surprising, it's exactly 365 times. Now, notice what is here. It is not that the Quran has a statement that says, look, there are 365 days in a year. Everyone can make that statement. Even a child uh, can make that statement, and, and that would not be at all surprising. That's what we all learn. But what is surprising is if I pick up a book, any book, I pick up a book, and I ask, how many times... It's a word used in this book. I go to the index and look at the number of times the word is used. Now, if I look up the word day, and I find that it is used exactly 365 times, now I would say that this is surprising, because usually authors do not go about their business trying to make sure that they use a certain word a number of times. And if they did do it that way, then they might want to make that public. They're doing that for a reason. Or they may have some secret reason for doing that, that eventually we might come to understand. In the case of the Prophet Muhammad reciting the Quran a bit at a time, over a period of 23 years, in a variety of circumstances, uh, it changing circumstances that he personally could not predict on his own, uh, giving guidance and instruction, uh, dealing with the specific circumstances. And then for us to find, after the book is put together, all of the written pieces are compiled and copied, and verified with the memories of those who had memorized the text. And then we count the number of words after all of that, and we find out that the word day is used 365 times. That seems to reflect a plan. 
And it does not seem to be the plan of Muhammad or any human being who worked on the Quranic text uh, early on. Uh, and it seems, therefore, that this uh, is uh, some evidence here of divine uh, intervention, that the Quran, therefore, is uh, given to us as the word of God. Now there is more. It turns out that some other sorts of studies have been done on the Quran as well. And for this I re rely on some studies done by Bassam Jarar of uh, the Noon Center for Quranic Studies in Palestine. Now what um, What Bassam has uh, shown, and, uh, and you can look at his website on this, islamnoon.com. I, I wish I had written that for you so you can, you can have a look. islamnoon.com. Well, let's, uh, let's have a look at what some of these uh, findings are that he has shown. If you look at the chapter numbers in the Quran, the, the, ch the, the chapters go from 1 to 114. Now, and that's simple, of course. You, you number chapters 1, 2, 3, 4. It turns out that there are 114 chapters of the Quran altogether. Now, the number of verses within each chapter seem to be there at random. In fact, non-Muslims uh, who have uh, come to the Quran for the first time have tried to explain why is it like this. It looks like the numbers are all over the place. The first chapter has seven verses. The second chapter has 286. The third chapter has uh, 200. The fourth chapter has 176. It looks like the numbers go up and down with, with, with no particular order. So some have said it looks like the Quran is arranged such that the longer surahs are put at the beginning and the shorter surahs are put at the end. And yet if we look at them uh, throughout, we see that that, that that pattern is not uniform. So what then is the explanation for all of this? Is there some relationship of a numerical nature, forget about meaning now for the moment, is there a relationship between the absolute numbers of the chapters and the number of verses that each chapter contains? Now, sometimes we notice that, yes, there is a kind of a surprising relationship. As we notice here in the case of Surah Al-Hadid, that is the Surah or the chapter of iron, uh, that's chapter number 57. We see that the number of verses in that chapter are 20, the, the number is 29. And it turns out that uh, the product of the chapter number and the number of verses within this chapter uh, is 1,653. And it also turns out that the sum of numbers from 1 to 57 is 1,653. And of course, some of you math students may have already worked that out because there's a formula for computing uh, the sum of a series of, of numbers. If the series of numbers end with, ends with n, then the formula is n into n plus 1 over 2. So 57 plus 1 is 58 times 57 over 2. So that's 29 times 57, right? Because 29 is half of 58. And that's exactly what you have there, 29 times 57. So it turns out that uh, there is uh, a reason behind the way things are put in the Quran. And this reason we are now discovering, or we are discovering part of the reason. We cannot say we know all of the wisdom of God here. We are just simply making some observations, and we're seeing that these are surprising correspondences between things in the Quran. Now, uh, chapter Al-Hajj 22, chapter 22 has the last mention of Hajj that is found in the Quran, and that is in verse number 27. That uh, verse has 14 words, if we count the words, and it turns out that there's a similar mathematical relationship in that uh, 14 times 27 gives 360, 378, and the sum of all of the numbers all the way down to uh, 27 is also 378. Now, chapter of Noah. The chapter of Noah in the Quran, chapter 71, seems to be placed in an interesting place because... It has 71, it has 28 verses, and it, uh, it turns out also that uh, Noah is mentioned in 28 different chapters in the Quran. 
And because some chapters mention Noah more than once, it turns out that Noah is mentioned a total of 43 times in the entire Quran. Now what is the relationship then between these numbers, just taken as absolute values? If one had these numbers uh, in one's mind, uh, what uh, sorts of combinations would we have? 43 plus 28 turns out to be 71, which is the chapter number. And uh, 43 plus 71 equals 114, which is the uh, number of chapters in the entire Quran. So since 71 is the last chapter to mention Noah, and it turns out that uh, there are 114 chapters in the Quran, it, it means therefore that there are 43 chapters before this chapter that do not mention Noah, and there are 43 chapters after it that also likewise do not mention Noah. It turns out then that this chapter numbered at uh, 71 is placed in the Quran in a strategic position. And yet it's now only that we are discovering what this is. Now there, uh, there are two verses in the Quran that mention a thunder. Uh, it's mentioned in chapter 2, verse number 19, and in chapter 13, verse uh, number 13. Now let's look at them one after another. In chapter 13, verse number 13, uh, we, if we count the words, we see that there are exactly 19 words. And those words are put together by 83 letters. And again, we're counting the consonantal text as it has survived from the time of Uthman for 1,400 years now. Now, 19 words and 83 letters. It turns out also that thunder mentioned in this uh, chapter uh, is uh, in chapter 13. It is in verse number 13. And uh, it also turns out to be in part number 13, the 13th uh, juz, 13 out of 30. And it didn't have to be there. The chapter 13 could have been in another juz, but it uh, turns out that by coincidence, here it is. The thir this word thunder is mentioned here in chapter 13, in part number 13, in verse number 13. And it has 19 uh, words and 83 letters. So just remember that 19 and 83. Because when we go to the other place in the, in the Quran where thunder is mentioned, we find that this is in chapter 2, in verse number 19. And that verse also contains 19 words. And that is also made up of 83 letters. Although they're entirely different. When you look at the, what the two verses say, the two verses say very different things. So it's not like someone just copied and pasted the same words from one into the other. So what accounts for this uh, very precise correspondence here between these two mentions of thunder in the Quran? It seems that this too is by a plan, and it's not the plan of Muhammad. So you can see them together graphically, that uh, the two verses in the Quran that mention thunder is uh, in ch chapter 13 and uh, chapter 2. In chapter 13, it's in chapter 13, in part number 13, in verse number 13. It's uh, composed of 19 words and 83 letters. And at the same time, in chapter 2, in verse number 19, we have here another mention of thunder in, with uh, 19 words and 83 letters. Let's move on. The chapter of prostration, chapter 32 in the Quran, is interesting. Um, and Muslims have, um, in their tradition, and the, the observation of a prostration, they, they prostrate when they hear certain particular verses in the Quran. To put it in another way, there are certain verses of the Quran which speak of, uh, of prostrating before God in, in such a pointed manner that the Muslim response naturally is to prostrate after having recited those verses. Some scholars of Islam think that this is uh, an obligation for Muslims and others think it is only a recommendation. One who took this last view is uh, Omar, the second caliph of Islam. It is reported that once from the mimbar, from the pulpit, he recited one such verse, and then he said that deliberately reciting it and not prostrating to make the point that it is not a requirement. But nevertheless, these verses give that strong feeling to the reader, and uh, Muslims will prostrate when they recite that. Now, the chapter number is 32, and it is called the chapter of the prostration, Surah the sajda or the chapter of the prostration, Precisely because within this chapter it mentions a key word, sujadan, prostrate. And uh, we will find out now that it turns out that this chapter number is 32. And the number of chapters that mention del derivatives of the word sajada, from which we get the word prostration in Arabic, are 32. Now this chapter has 30 verses. 
And it turns out that our key word, sujadan, is in the 15th verse, which is exactly at the halfway point. And uh, that uh, verse that mentions the prostration is composed of 15 uh, words. It is verse number 15 composed of 15 words. And uh, there are 15 such verses in the entire Quran. Some scholars think that there are only 14, but uh, some others think that there are 15. And uh, the uh, full uh, reference for that is given in Ahmad von Denver's book, Ulum al-Quran. So now, it turns out that this uh, chapter contains 372 words altogether. And the word sujadan, which is our key word, is again at the halfway point when considered from this angle, because it is the 186th word. So that key word, sujadan, is at the halfway point in terms of the number of verses, because it's the 15th verse out of 30. And it's also at the halfway point in terms of the number of words in that chapter, because it is 186 out of 372. So, let's move on. Chapter an -Namal or the ant. It's an interesting chapter in the Quran for the story it tells about Solomon and so on. But we're looking now at, at a specific angle. We're not uh, in the, at the moment concerned with the meaning and the message of the Quran here. We're, we're asking, is there a correspondence between the numbers of things that uh, give rise to a suggestion that this uh, is really the word of God? Now, the chapter begins with uh, the Arabic letters Ta and Sin, which I've, I've given here simply as T and S for our English uh, uh, speaking uh, persons in the audience. Now, nobody knows why this is there. You know, it's not T.S. Eliot, but it's the initial of something. What is it? Uh, nobody knows. Muslim scholars can only resign themselves to saying that this is something mysterious. It is there. It's part of the Quran. We recite it, but uh, we don't know what it means. The, the meaning is best left to God. And perhaps this is one way of God saying to people, look, the Quran is composed of simple letters like uh, uh, you use to compose any sort of uh, rhetoric. And at the same time, the Quran is such uh, a, a literary masterpiece that you cannot match the beauty and eloquence of the Quran. Uh, you have the building blocks, but you cannot do it. Uh, so nobody knows what uh, that, that is. But at the same time, everyone agrees that the, it's not there with, uh, without a purpose. So what is it? Now, we do notice something interesting about that, in that in that chapter, the number of pause are 27, and the number of scenes are 93. Now it turns out that uh, that chapter number is 27, and the number of verses in that chapter is 93. Now nobody composes something and then counts how many letters they have used in that. And in fact, if you counted it in hindsight and found out that it is so, it would be quite marvelous. It would be quite interesting. So what we have then is the case of, the, of a book written 1,400 years ago, and uh, we're counting it later on, and we're looking at the counts of things, and we're finding them to, uh, we're finding them to match certain patterns. And that seems to suggest uh, that the mind is behind the Quran. Now, chapter 9 and chapter uh, 27 uh, are, are bound to... Uh, be connected in the minds of, uh, of curious readers because chapter 9 is the only chapter in the Quran that does not start with the standard formula Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, which translated into English would be in the name of God the beneficent the merciful now the Quran begins uh, like that in all of the um, chapters except for chapter 9 and uh, no one knows exactly why uh, some have suggested it is because uh, God's uh, anger is uh, depicted in, in the beginning of that chapter. So it would seem uh, opposed to the mention of God's mercy just before that. But the more likely suggestion is one given in Sahih al-Bukhari, an early collection of uh, sayings attributed to the Prophet Muhammad and to some of his companions, uh, where it says that Uthman, at the time of compiling uh, the Quranic pieces together, uh, could not be sure whether the 8th chapter and the ninth chapter are two separate chapters or whether together they form actually just one chapter. And because of this uncertainty, he did not insert the standard formula that comes at the beginning of a chapter. So he left it in this way, that it came to be considered as a separate chapter, but without that uh, opening formula. But uh, that chapter missing its opening formula in the mind of the reader, would get connected with chapter 27, which in the body of the chapter itself mentions the formula. 
Because it says that when Solomon wrote a letter to the Queen of Sheba, he began it by writing Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Same formula. It's mentioned in Surah 27, verse number 30. So then, these two chapters become connected in the mind of a curious reader. And if you look at the numbers here, the numbers are quite interesting. Because the uh, number of chapters from 9 to 27 are 18. And uh, at the same time, if we take them inclusively, in other words, the, the, the exclusive difference between 27 and 9 is 18. And if we take them inclusively, the number of chapters from 9 to 27 as a block are 19 chapters altogether. Now, 18 and 19, it turns out, are two special numbers here because their product gives uh, four, uh, their product gives 342. And at the same time, the sum of numbers from 9 to 27 is also 342. Now, their number, uh, I mean, their number of two, a combination of two numbers that will give you a product of 342, but only this sequence from 9 to 27 would give you a sum of 342. Now, Anamal, which is the name of this chapter, the chapter of the ant, is mentioned only in one place uh, in the Quran. Actually, I, I've, made, I've noted here two places, but that's incorrect. It's, uh, there, there are two mentions of Anamal, but it, both are in this one particular verse in the Quran. It's in the chapter of Nanal, chapter 27. It is in verse 18, and the number of words there are 19. Again, highlighting the interplay between 18 and 19. Now, I don't know how visible this is all the way from, from the back, so I'm going to have to come up here and have a look at it. Now, if we were to ask uh, how many chapters are in the entire Quran, you already know that. It's uh, 114. But Notice the total there of all of the chapter numbers. Again, you can use your formula to verify that I'm correct on that. n into n plus 1 over 2 will give you 6,565, just like you see my total there in the green. I think you can all see that now. Okay, so those are all the chapter numbers in the Quran. Normally, I would have listed it all the way going down, 1 down to 114, but my PowerPoint presentation wouldn't show you 114 lines altogether in a way that you can... You can see it. But you can actually do this on your, uh, on your own. Open up a Microsoft Excel worksheet program and list all of the chapter numbers in the Quran, 1 down to 114, and hit summation at the end of that line. And you will, of course, get that same total, 6,555. Then go to every chapter in the Quran and find out how many verses are in that chapter. Now, in some Arabic text, it will be given to you at the, at the beginning. It said this is a, a, an ayah, either Maki or Madani, uh, and it will tell you how many ayahs uh, are there at the beginning. But uh, most English texts do not do that, so you would have to go to the end of each chapter and find out what is the number of the last verse, and then make a separate column listing all of those. And you would see that chapter 1 has 7 verses, chapter 2 has 286, chapter 3 has 200, chapter 4 has 176, 120, 165, and so on, and I've snaked them, but you will have them all going down in a single column. And you'll find out that the total number of verses in the entire Quran is 6,236. Now, there are different num ways of numbering and different ways of reciting the Quran and giving uh, rise to different numbers. But this numbering system has become a, very, a standard in the Egyptian edition of the Quran prepared in 1924, and going back to early forms of recitation uh, accredited to uh, early scholars, such as Hafs from Asim, from the 2nd and 3rd centuries of Islam. So we have 6,236 uh, verses. Now, uh, before I go any further, maybe you might want to remember these, these numbers. So if you look back at the previous one, it was 6,555. That was the total of uh, all of the chapter numbers in the entire Quran. You remember that number because it's 6555. It's the kind of number you'd like to have for your telephone number, right? It's a 6555. Okay, and then the, no the total number of verses in the entire Quran is 6,236. And that too is easy to remember because you already remembered the six from the other previous number. And look what comes at the end. It's another six. So your job is done. And in the middle, you have two numbers which give you a product of six. So just think, think six, two threes are six, and you got it, okay? So then, 
what happens now is that if you were to do this exercise, you will be surprised to find that if we were to take the total of the, the chapter numbers and, and the, the total number of verses in each chapter together, then you would have something that looks like this. All right, the total, the number of chapters and the number of, total number of verses in each uh, chapter. It will, it will appear quite jumbled, so if we simplify that. Now, if we take all of the, you have the chapter number and the verses in each chapter. Let me see if I'm making sense here. Now, take all of the chapters that give you an even result. So you have chapter 1 has 7 verses, chapter 2 has 286 verses, chapter 4 has 176 uh, verses. So all of these will give you an even, not an even result. Now this is, this is not really uh, bringing that home, but I will explain. Let me see if another slide will, will help me here. It's it more of the class, it can be cheering. Okay, none, none, of this is, none of this is doing what I want to, what I want to explain. But I'll, I'll put it to you simply and, and it will be clear. So, you have made two columns. One of all of the chapter numbers in the Quran, and the total of that is 6,555. Now, you've made a list of all of the verses in, that are in each chapter. And you have found out that the total of that is 6,236. 6,236. Now, we want to know, is there a master plan that put all of these verse numbers in each chapter? In other words, how was it decided what number of verses go in each chapter? Now again, we don't know all of the wisdom of God, and we don't have all of the answers, but something interesting has been found. If you take the total of each chapter number, with the number of verses within that chapter, you will get naturally 114 results. True? Now, the results by themselves are not interesting until you analyze them. When you analyze them, you will find out that out of the 114 results, 57 of them are even numbers and 57 of them are odd numbers. Now, according to probability theory, that works out exactly right. So it's not entirely surprising. It is only surprising to the extent that it is so exact. Because if you toss a coin 114 times, according to probability theory, 57 times it will come up heads and 57 times it will come up tails. So, so that's not surprising. And yet one feels that perhaps it could have been 59 and, uh, and 56 or something like this. Hmm? Or 59 and, and 55. It doesn't have to be exactly 57 and 57. Why is it exactly so? But as I said, that's not so entirely surprising. So let's leave that uh, alone. And just look at the numbers then in total. If you were to then continue your exercise on the Microsoft Excel, work Excel worksheet program or any other uh, worksheet program, if you were to take a list of all of your even number results and total them, you would see that your total of those 57 even number results is exactly 6,236. And that was your total of the number of verses in the entire Quran. What about the odd number results? The other 57 numbers, which are odd numbers in your results, if totaled, would come up to 6,555. So you have here a double coincidence. And it doesn't seem like this is by coincidence. It seems too much to credit to mere coincidence. So let's go over that again so you appreciate what has happened. What we've done is we've taken a book that was written some 1,400 years ago. And we've listed all of the chapter numbers, which is a very simple exercise, and it's not unique to this book. Any book having 114 chapters will have it such that the total of all of the chapter numbers will be 6,555. Nothing surprising so far. And then we listed the number of verses in each chapter, which has been a puzzle for people. What, why does a particular chapter has, have, have a particular number of verses? How is the Quran arranged? Is it from large verses down to the smaller verses, or how? It looks like the numbers are all over the place, as we saw. But is there a relationship between the chapter number and the number of verses within each chapter? Now we found that when we take the total of the chapter number and the verse, number of verses within that chapter, we get 114 results. 
naturally, because you're doing 114 little sums. Out of the 114 results, we saw that 57 were even numbers and 57 were odd numbers. If we take just the even numbers and total those, we get the same number as the total number of verses in the entire Quran, and that came only from 57 chapters. And at the same time, if we took the 57 odd number results and totaled those, we got the same result, we got the same number as the total of all of the chapter numbers in the entire Quran. Now that's a double co coincidence, and it's just too much to credit to coincidence because the numbers are so large. If we work in similar jobs and we both get the same pay, then uh, uh, you know that's uh, not such a great coincidence because that's to be expected. But uh, if we go out each on a spending spree, and I check my credit card bill at the end of the month, and you check yours at the end of the month, and they both have the same big massive total that will make us cry, then <laughs> something strange is going on in our world. Uh, and it looks like there is something here very strange about the Quran, and Muslims think they know the answer for that strangeness. They believe that this is a revelation from uh, the Almighty God. Now let's see if um, there is something else that we can find here that is, uh, that is interesting. Now, in the Hebrew tradition, numbers were represented by letters. So, now, of course, in English, we're not accustomed to this because we have our Arabic numerals that we work with from 1 to 9 and to 0. It gives us uh, an unlimited number of expressions. But the Hebrew language was not developed such. They had 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, and they used uh, letters to represent numbers. And of course, sometimes we still use letters to represent numbers. We label things A, B, C, D, for example, instead of 1, 2, 3, 4. Uh, and in that case, we're using the letters A, B, C, D to represent the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4. But this was more common in the Hebrew language. And it was uh, quite well known as well that uh, people played with these numbers. In the Gospel according to Matthew, in chapter 1, in verse number 17, we are told uh, that the genealogy of Jesus is such that you have uh, from Abraham all the way down to Jesus, 42 generations. So Matthew tells us that there were 14 generations from Abraham to David, and then 14 generations from David to the Babylonian exile, and then 14 generations from the Babylonian exile all the way down to Jesus. Now, scholars have compared the genealogy given by Matthew with that given in the books of Chronicles and in Genesis to see how Matthew has done with those uh, names that are already known from the Old Testament. And they have found that Matthew did not include all of the names in the genealogical lists. Matthew has, in fact, tailored the list to give you precisely 14. So it is not that he discovered 14 and he just simply noted them down. Matthew has deliberately created the list so that you will have three sets of 14. And now they've asked, why? Why would Matthew do this? Why would he omit names in order to give you this neat list? And the answer is that David, or Dawid, Dawid in Hebrew is actually written without vowels, just as Arabic is, and it, it turns out that uh, Dawid is written DVD. <laughs> uh, Dawid. And, uh, Again, that the letters have uh, numerical values. So on the Abjad system, it's, um, D is, is 4, uh, V is 6, and the other D is 4. So the, the name David can be represented by the number 14. Now, it doesn't work the other way around, because 14 might represent something entirely different as well. But you, you can go from the name to the number, but you cannot go from the number to the name. And uh, the difficulty of going from the number to the name has been felt in the book of Revelation in chapter 13, uh, chapter 13 where it says the number of his name is 666. And people have uh, torn their brains out to find out who is represented by the number 666. Because it could be the Emperor Nero, it could be some even suggested Martin Luther when he started the Reformation and so on. So you can make an, a number mean anything, but the name will have only one numerical value. So it turns out then that Matthew, knowing the numerical value of uh, David's name, 
try to make it such that Jesus, a descendant of David, is so neatly descended from David that you have 14 generations from Abraham to David, and another 14 to the Babylonian exile, and then another 14 all the way down to the Messiah, Jesus. So you understand how these uh, have been used in Hebrew. Now, the same thing is used in Arabic. In the Arabic language, we can label things uh, using Arabic letters. But we don't go alif ba cha sa the way it is in the, in the Arabic alphabet order today. We go with the abjad system. Now, it, of course, uh, you are familiar with two different systems in English as well, because you have A, B, C, D as our usual uh, sequence, and then you have the Q wordy keyboard. Q-W-E-R-T-Y, that's how your letters are arranged on your keyboard, that becomes a standard by itself. It turns out that based on the old Hebrew system, in which Dawood uh, or David was uh, numbered 14, you have the same thing, D is 4. We'll see that more clearly when I show you the next slide. But this is how the numbers were basically arranged. I haven't given you all of the letters, just to keep the chart simple and visible all the way from the end. So it goes Aleph, uh, Be, Aleph Ba, Jim, Dal, uh, and so on. And uh, people have constructed mnemon mnemonic words in order to help them re remember the sequence. So it's Abjad, Hawaz, Hoti, uh, Kalamun, and, and then it goes on Safas and, and uh, Kurshat uh, and Dahud. Right? So you're laughing because you, you know this. Uh, so this is how you would label a thing in in Arabic. When I first started learning Arabic, in fact, uh, I asked one of my Arabic-speaking friends, why, why are the Arabic books always labeling things A, B, G, D? Well, what, what's that? So he told me it's that's the equivalent of A, B, C, D. It's so, A, B, G, D. He didn't know. And that's excusable. But then, it turns out then that these, uh, this is how the numbers, are, this is how they are valued. Uh, we go from 1 all the way up to 9, and then we start with 10s, we go up to 90, and then we go to the 100s, and we go all the way to 900, and the last letter, the 28th letter of the Arabic alphabet, is, well, the 28th letter in this uh, uh, sequence would be labeled uh, 1,000, and that would be the numerical values. So then, knowing this, it is easy... Uh, for us to make some observations. Let's, let's go back over it and make some observations. Remember we looked at Surah and Namal. Remember that, Surah and Namal? And we said that it begins with, uh, the Surah of the Ant, it begins with two mysterious letters, the T and the S, Ta and Sin. And we said that the Ta is used in that chapter exactly 27 times. And we saw that the scene is used in that chapter exactly 93 times. Now what's 27 and 93? What is the sum of 27 and 93? Don't get your phone, brother. <laughs> it's 120. 120. Yes, 120. Now what's NAML in this numerical value system? We can see all the letters down here from Kalamun. It, it, noon is 50. Meme is 40. And lamb is 30, so we have 120. Namal is 120. So, it, on that system, it looks like there was more meaning to, to things than at first meet, uh, meets the eye. Now, we looked at chapter 57, and we saw that um, uh, chapter 57 in the Quran is ch the chapter of the iron, chapter al Hadid, yes? Now, interesting. What is uh, Al-Hadid? Well, let's start with simple. Let's go Hadid. What's Hadid now in terms of this system? Hadid. So we have the Ha, which is 8. We have Dal, which is 4. That's 12. We have Ya somewhere. Ya is 10. What does that give us so far? 32. 22. And we have one more Dal at the end for 4. That's 26. Now what's 26 in, in terms of iron? The University of Sheffield uh, has an interesting page in which they have uh, given us details about the periodic table. And it turns out that 26 is the atomic number for iron. 26 is the atomic number of iron. So now if Hadid is 26, what if we put the definite article and make it Al-Hadid, which is the name of the chapter? Aleph is 1, and Lamb is 30. That's 31 plus 26. How much? 
57. And 57 is the number of Surat al-Hadith. It's chapter number 57. So it turns out then that there are more uh, ways of looking at the Quran than perhaps traditionally we have, uh, we have done. Bassam Jarar of the Noon Center for Quranic Studies has um, in fact uh, shown us how this sort of uh, work has been done with outside of, of the Quran where numbers have been assigned to things. But I also picked up a book uh, from uh, our equivalent of the Barnes and Nobles, our chapters in, in Toronto. Is entitled The Universal History of Numbers by Georges Ifra, uh, translated by Bellos, uh, Harding, Wood, and Monk. Now, on page 244, uh, the, the author gives us this uh, number system, and then he shows us how in history people have used this, both uh, in Hebrew and in, in, in uh, Greek, and also now in Arabic to represent uh, various things. For example, in uh, in Hebrew, uh, someone composed this chronogram on a Jewish tombstone. So they say that uh, the year one drop of dew on 5,000. Now, the one drop, uh, the, the dew drop, in fact, is underlined to indicate that that represents a number. And if you were to take it literally, it means nothing, one drop of dew on 5,000. But once, once we give the numerical equivalent of one drop, it turns out to be 83. And the year is represented then as 83 on 5,000, meaning 5,083. Uh, similarly, uh, uh, in the Arabic usage, we have um, the uh, scholar Al-Biruni, who wanted to write the one, year 1,335. So he composed a phrase which says in Arabic, Najatul Khalqi min al-Kufri bi Muhammad, that the, the, uh, Muhammad saves the world from unbelief. And that is how he represented the year 1,335. Now, Bassam Jarrah from the New Noon Center for Quranic Studies has given us some other examples uh, on how Muslim scholars have used this. For example, when the Sultan Barkuk, uh, uh, the Burji Mamluk uh, king, died, um, the, the ruler Sultan died, uh, the, uh, it was said that uh, he died Phil Mishmish in the apricot season. And Phil Mishmish uh, turns out to be 801, and that was the way of saying that he died in the year 801. <laughs> and uh, uh, the, the poet uh, Dalenjawi died, uh, um, and his friend uh, eulogized him uh, by saying, Mata uh, Shi'rubada. The poetry died after him. And it turns out that that, that phrase uh, uh, works out to 1,123. And that was the year in which this man died, 1,123 of the Hijra. Now, turning to the Quran, we have already seen some examples of where this, um, there is some correspondence of this sort. But uh, Jarrah gives us some other examples here as well. Uh, he says that the, the sacred mosque in Mecca, uh, the Masjid al-Haram, is described in the Quran, in Surah 3, verse 96, as, now, the farthest mosque, the Masjid al-Aqsa, is also described by a certain phrase. It says, So if you think of these two phrases, and it turns out that both have the same jumal, the same total numerical value, uh, which uh, works out to 1,000 and 63. So there's some correspondence here between things. Now, Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa uh, has the numerical value of 361. And at the same time, Banu Israel has the same, uh, the people of Israel have the same numerical value, 361. Bassam has also shown that uh, when we look at the word Abiyad in the, in the Quran, uh, the word abiyad, meaning white, has the numerical value 813. And if we add up all of the verse numbers everywhere in the Quran where abiyad, white, or any of its forms is mentioned, uh, that also, the, the total of all of those verse numbers also works out to 813. So you see there is uh, more than initially meets the eye. There's one other area that I want to talk to you about very quickly, and then we wrap up this whole discussion, and I'll take your questions. Now. 
uh, this area fell into disrepute because the man who initially proposed um, studies in this uh, field uh, said things which Muslims didn't like. He eventually claimed to be a prophet. And uh, in the Muslim tradition, that's a no-no. Because the Prophet Muhammad is uh, on record as having said, La Nabi Abadi, there's no prophet after me. So if anyone comes and claims uh, that he's a follower of the Prophet Muhammad, and at the same time he himself claims to be a prophet, he contradicts himself. And this has occurred with uh, some persons over time. Uh, there was a man from India, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed of Qadian, and now this other person, Rashad Khalifa, uh, an Egyptian who settled in the United States of America. He had some knowledge of computers, and so he fed the Quranic data into his computer system, and he did some checks. And uh, he found that there are some uh, things in the Quran which seem to correspond with the number 19. Uh, now, the number 19, uh, for its own reasons, uh, uh, may be viewed uh, with some suspicion by uh, traditional Muslims because the number 19 has some significance in the Baha'i faith. Uh, so all of these reasons together made it uh, such that the number uh, 19, uh, as a way of looking at the Quran, did not in fact pick up speed. Uh, moreover, when uh, the results of this, man, of this man's work were checked thoroughly, it was found that many of his results were way out of whack. That sometimes he actually fudged his data in order to bring about the results. He became obsessed with the idea of finding things 19 times or a number of times that are a multiple of 19 in the Quran, uh, to the extent that he wanted to even make the data fit his conclusion. And uh, that, of course, in any scientific study uh, is uh, taboo. Uh, so his studies were not taken seriously. But now when all of the dust of uh, controversy has settled, uh, we can look back at some of the results and see where he has actually been correct and ask if, if we take those results which have been correct and uh, we add other observations which can be further be studied by any individual and we put them all together with our presentation here tonight, whether, of course, whether all of this can mean something. And it seems that, yes, there is something there that can mean something for our conclusion. Here, uh, in Surah 74, verse uh, number 30, uh, the Quran is just finishing up a description of hell and says, Alayha tis'ata ashar, over it are 19. And this has been traditionally taken by Muslim scholars to mean that there are 19 angels guarding hell. Uh, but uh, why 19? The next verse, verse number 31, uh, says um, something interesting. It goes on and on about the use uh, of this number. So we're looking at Surah Al-Mudathir, uh, so that's Surah number 74. And in verse number 31, it tells us why God made this number. وَمَا جَعَلْنَا أَصْحَابَ النَّارِ إِلَّا مَلَائِكَ وَمَا جَعَلْنَا إِدَّتَهُمْ إِلَّا فِتْنَةً لِلَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لِيَسْتَيْكِنَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابُ وَيَزْدَادَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِيمَانًا وَلَا يَرْتَابَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَلِيَقُولَ الَّذِينَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مَرَضٌ وَالْكَافِرُونَ مَاذَا أَرَادَ اللَّهُ بِهَذَا مَثَلًا كَذَلِكَ يُضِلُّ اللَّهُ مَا يَشَاءُ وَيَهْدِي مَن يَشَاءُ وَمَا يَعْلَمُ جُنُودَ رَبِّكَ إِلَّا هُوَ وَمَا هِيَ إِلَّا ذِكْرَى لِلْبَشَرِ Now, it's a very long verse. In fact, the rest of the chapter has very short verses. So, why this sudden, suddenly this long verse to go on and on about 19. Now, this is what initially sparked the attention of the, Dr. Rashad Khalifa. And, uh, in fact, it continues to be something that is quite intriguing. Now, look what it says that this 19 will do. We have set none but angels as guardians of the fire, and we have fixed their number only as a trial for the disbelievers, in order that the people of the Scripture uh, may arrive at a certainty I'm trying to go past all of the brackets, and that no doubts may be left for the people of the scripture and the believers, and that those in whose hearts is a disease uh, and the disbelievers may say, what Allah intends by, uh, what, what, what does Allah intend by this curious example? Thus Allah leads astray whom he wills and guides whom he wills, and none can know the hosts of your Lord but he. And this is nothing else uh, than a warning, uh, a reminder to mankind. So this uh, mention here of 19 will, will do a number of things. It will, seem, it will, it will separate the, the wheat from the chaff. Uh, it, uh, it will give certainty to the people of the scripture. It will increase the believers in faith. It will uh, remove any doubts from the people of the scripture. 
and also from the believers. Whereas on the other hand, uh, others would be saying, what, what does God intend by this, uh, by this, by, by, by mentioning this? And this is the way that God guides some people and misguides some, some others. So the number 19 here is said to be something that's going to do uh, something great. It's going to have a great effect. Why is not 19? Now, it is noted that the opening formula of the Quran, which we have mentioned before, as Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, traditionally has been written with 19 letters. Although it can be written with 22, but traditionally it has been written with exactly 19. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Look at the consonantal text, the way it was written in the time of uh, Uthman Radiallahu Anh, with no shadda or anything. There are exactly 19 letters, and that is over the Quran. What else is 19 in the Quran? Now, it turns out that the first uh, revelation given to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is uh, now found in chapter 96. Chapter 96 in the Quran. Now, anyone who studies the life of the Prophet Muhammad will come across a description of the first uh, revelation that he received, how the angel came to him and directed him to read. And he said, I don't know how to read. Ma'ana bikhare. And uh, then eventually the angel tells him what to read. Ikra bismi rabbikal ladhi khalaq. Khalaq al-insana min alaq. Ikra wa rabbukal akram. Alladhi alama bil khalaq. Alam al-insana ma'alam ya'alam. These words are now found in the first five verses of chapter 96. Because the Quran is arranged uh, not according to the chronology of how it was revealed, but according to some other system, some of the wisdom of which we are now only discovering, as we have seen from our numerical study tonight. So, these uh, uh, verses now are found in chapter number 96. Chapter 96, it turns out, is the first of the last 19 chapters in the Quran. Because if this is chapter 96, it means there are 95 chapters that came before it. So 95 from 114 is exactly 19. This is one of 100 uh, uh, of the last, this is the first of the last 19 chapters. Now, how many verses are in this chapter? 19 verses. The initial revelation which I've recited to you, which are contained within the first five verses, are made up of exactly 76 letters. You can count them one after another. Anyone who knows the Arabic language can do this. One who doesn't even know the Arabic language can be just simply trained to recognize the letters as we have put them up and uh, can count them one after another. They're exactly 76. And that turns out to be 19 times 4. The rest of that chapter is made up of 209 letters. And that is 19 times 11. So it turns out that the entire chapter is made up of 285 letters, which is 19 times 15. It's not a new observation, it's just the two observations put together. 285 turns out to be a significant number because in the Quran, uh, the, the mentions of numbers uh, turn out to be exactly 285 times. In other words, if you were to comb the entire Quran and find every time the Quran mentions a number and clock that, we would clock 285 times that the Quran mentions a number, any number, all, all numbers together, 285. Now, Surah Al-Jinn, chapter 71 in the Quran is interesting because uh, it ends with the word number, Surah Al-Jinn, chapter 71. What does it say? Actually, it's chapter 72, my mistake. Chapter 72 ends with the word number. What does it say? Well, ahsa kull shay'in adada. God has taken account of everything individually. God has taken count. So the last word there is adada. It turns out that this word adada is the 285th word in this chapter, in this chapter, because this chapter also has exactly 285 words. Now. We can go on and on about this, but the point, I think, is, is already made, and, and I have to give time for your questions, that the Quran has been studied from a variety of angles, and people have looked into the Quran and they have found things that uh, are of interest to them based on their individual uh, fields of endeavor. Scientists have looked at the Quran and they have found that the Quran 
says things that correspond with modern scientific discoveries, although this should not be expected to be so because the Quran was written some 1400 years ago. It should reflect the ideas of the time. But uh, now we're finding that the Quran is uh, describing things that are amazing to us. Things that people are now discovering, like the expansion of the universe, like the growth and development of the human baby. So whether things big or things small, the Quran seems to be true to its word, which says, Sanurihim ayatina fil afati wa fi anfusihim hatta yatabayyana lahum anawul haq. We shall show them our signs in the heavens and in, in themselves until it becomes clear to them that this is our truth, that this is the truth. So it seems that there is a, a reason behind all of this. And now recently people have looked at the Quran from a different point of view, from the point of view of uh, uh, numerics, not numerology. Numerology is the um, habit of uh, assigning mystical value uh, to certain numbers. You know, like you have a lucky number seven and an unlucky number 13 and so on. But uh, we're, we're not speaking of numerology, where mystical value is assigned to, to numbers. But we're asking, uh, are there numbers of things in the Quran that seem to reflect uh, a plan, and uh, is that a human plan? And we have seen that, in fact, yes, there are um, numbers in the Quran that correspond to each other in a way that reflects a plan. And we know that this was never a human plan. And the best explanation for that is that this is by a divine plan that we are now discovering, and hence that the Quran is what it says it is. It is the Word of God. And it is to this book that I invite all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Shabir. May Allah reward you, inshallah, for this uh, valuable lecture. Uh, in fact, he speaks only from the numerics point of view, but Quran always discusses many miracles like the seas. He, it classifies it's the darkness, the level of darkness of the seas and the heaven, which are seven levels, and even the, the stage of the baby in, in during the pregnancy. Uh, but for the time limitation, uh, Brother Shabir only spoken about the uh, numerics. Anyway, this is the time for the question. Uh, we have two, type of qu two types of question. We have mic, if you like, and we have also papers, pieces of papers. It will be distributed in both sides, so if you like. So it's your time now for question, uh, Brother Shabir. I'd just like to ask, uh, how do you think that non-believers will uh, be convinced just by numbers? I mean, okay, they, they are quite coincidental, but how do you think uh, non-believers will actually believe it's more than just coincidence? Well, in fact, uh, for, for most people, thinking is, uh, is a very complex process. And uh, one doesn't uh, become convinced by one thing alone. People have to put things together. They have to make connections. Uh, the Quran's um, uh, prime claim is that it is a teaching that uh, is reasonable. It is a teaching that uh, brings people to a better understanding of God and to a closer relationship with God. Uh, and, and that's what the Quran is about. It's not about numbers. But at the same time, the, what we have presented, I think, is a strong case uh, showing that uh, the Quran has a, a divine origin, just like it says it is. There's an explanation for this, uh, for the kinds of correspondence which we have noted between the numbers of things. And uh, there, are, there are basically three responses to uh, this uh, presentation. One is to say that this is all by coincidence. But I think that this is a weak response, because the, the numbers we have seen is, uh, are, are such that it would be too much to credit to simple coincidence. 
what are the chances, for example, that you pick up a book, any book, and you find that uh, it mentions uh, the word day a number of times that is exactly 365, for example, uh, or some of the other correspondences that we have noted? What are the chances that you pick up a book and uh, you did the exercise we did with the chapters uh, and the verses in each chapter, and you find out that there is this double correspondence that we have found in the case of the Quran. So I think coincidence is not a very good uh, response. Uh, second, uh, a non-Muslim may suspect, not knowing much about the history of the Quran, that perhaps human beings might have done it like this. You know, that's fine. Shabir seems to have uh, presented some uh, very nice uh, instances of correspondence, but didn't some human being put that in like that to make it so? Uh, but uh, Muslims who are already familiar with the history of the Quran will think that, of course, no human being did that. And, and, and that, of course, is the history of the Quran, whether it is known to a Muslim or to a non-Muslim. Anyone who studies the history of the Quranic text will know that uh, no human being uh, worked on it to produce this. And in fact, it would have been difficult for any human being to have done it. First of all, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, could not have done that, because in his days writing, in his days, writing materials were not available as we have them now. Paper had been invented in China, but it wouldn't reach Arabia until the second century of Islam. And so initially the Quran was written down on diverse pieces, on pieces of stone and bone, and collected in the memories of people. So for him to remember uh, up to this point, how much of the Quran have I recited, and how many times have I mentioned a certain word, or how many verses are going to be in each chapter, this would be stupendous. It, 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 too much to imagine. Now initially when the Quran was written down, uh, separators were not marked between uh, the end of one verse and the beginning of another. People knew by recitation where they stopped. And it is eventually, based on the places where the reciter stopped, uh, later on the scribes would put in markers to identify the end of a verse. And initially, in fact, they only identified the end of, of every ten verses, and then the end of every five verses, and then left the space at the end of every verse and then eventually put a circle there to decorate the space. And eventually they put the numbers in uh, to, to uh, make it easy for us to reference things today by number. So initially, for someone to do this kind of exercise, uh, to look at the correspondence between the numbers of chapters and the numbers of verses, would have been impossible. So a human plan is not a good explanation for this. So what are we left with? To me, there are only three options. Either these correspondences uh, occurred by coincidence, or they occurred due to a human plan, or due to a divine plan. And it looks like the first two options are exhausted, and uh, we're down to the last one, uh, the suggestion that this is by a divine plan. And therefore, the Quran is what it says it is. It is the revelation from the Almighty God. Um. Hello. Hi. Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for coming. Uh, very educational. <clears throat> Just a quick question. Uh, it's a bit complicated to explain. Uh, you mentioned the Quran was revealed to Muhammad in bits and pieces, and it was written in, on pieces of stones and uh, in people's memories, and then it was compiled later on after the death of Muhammad. So, in a way, by definition, this is a man-made sequence, isn't it? Because you mentioned that the first, uh, the first ayah of Quran is, now exists in uh, Surah 97 and not number one. So where, where, where does the divine plan come into the sequencing, uh, sequencing of Quran itself? Yes. And okay. Let me just uh, make clear as well that I have no doubt on the word of Quran because I'm a believer in Quran and I believe in its miracles, but just on numerical kind of things I have. I understand. I understand your question. You're trying to understand the whole thing. Well, the divine intervention or involvement here is uh, at two levels. One is explicit. Uh, explicit in the sense that uh, the traditional reports have it that when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, received a piece of revelation, he would direct his scribes to insert this in such and such a surah where such and such a thing is mentioned. And the very manner in which this is worded shows that there were no chapter numbers and verse numbers. Otherwise, it would be very easy to refer to it by chapter number and verse number. But he would say in such and such a chapter in which such and such a thing is mentioned. 
So they, would, they have to know that's a chapter where such is mentioned and this goes next. Of course, they didn't have word processors, so they can just go make a quick insertion there, they had, but they could do this in their own memories. And so uh, the, the sequence then of things was by explicit divine instruction. And uh, the second uh, point I made was that uh, the divine involvement is implicit and that everything that people do uh, is by a divine plan. The Muslim belief is that nothing wor works outside of the Qadr or the plan of Allah, uh, the creator and the fashioner of the heavens and the earth. Uh, that doesn't mean that he's pleased with everything. But it uh, turns out that the whole process of the Quranic compilation, as you said, human beings were making judgments. Uthman asked, you know, does the, the uh, opening phrase, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, get placed at the beginning of chapter 9 or not? And it looks like human beings are making some judgments here. Uh, in certain things, they are very clear. In certain things, they're not so very clear. They're a little bit fuzzy on the edges, but they're doing the best they can. They're collecting it from the memories, or bringing all the written pieces together, asking how a certain word is to be spelt in writing and so on. So they're making certain human judgments. But it seems that uh, implicitly, there is the hand of God working through all of this, to use that expression. Uh, in, and, and we have the support for this from the Quranic text itself. In Surah 15, verse number 9, it says, إِنَّا نَحْنَ نَزَّلْنَا الذِّكْرَ وَإِنَّا لَهُ لَحَافِذُونَ We, that is God, has, uh, we have revealed the reminder, referring here to the Quran, and we are its guardian, or its guardians. Uh, God himself is protecting the, the Quran, whereas in the case of previous scriptures in Surah 5, uh, the, the previous scriptures are spoken about as that which has been entrusted uh, to the priests uh, and, and the rabbis. They, they have been made the, the ones to preserve it. But whereas the others have been made responsible for preserving the previous texts, God is saying in the Quran that he himself is responsible for preserving the text of the Quran. And in Surah 75, um, we have here a, a, a comment on the fact that the Prophet Muhammad, as he was receiving these pieces over time, was anxious as to whether or not he might be able to keep all of this in memory. So he was trying to recite it as the angel is revealing that to him quickly before it vanishes from his memory. And the, the Quran assures him by saying, لا تحرك به لسانك لتعجل به إن علينا جمعه وقرآن فإذا قرأناه فتبع قرآن ثم إن علينا بيانا uh, Now God is assuring the Prophet, don't move your tongue hastily to, 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 to try and, and preserve it. Uh, it is our responsibility uh, to cause it to be collected and to be read. And when we have caused it to be read, then uh, you just follow its recitation because it is then our responsibility to make it plain. So, so there is a special emphasis in the Quran that God himself is going to make sure that this uh, Quran is preserved correctly and passed on without change. So the, the in, divine in, intervention was implicit in some of the instructions that were given as to where a certain thing is to be placed. And it was explicit in that the hand of God was throughout the whole process, even when human beings uh, were making judgments uh, about uh, what, how to put things or how to spell things in the Quran. Question, is it true that the famous uh, oceanographer Jack uh, Cousteau yeah, uh, discovered that fresh water and salty water never mixed and found that it existed in a particular part of the ocean. Now, I'm not familiar with the name of that uh, oceanographer, as you can tell, but uh, I am familiar with the, the kinds of uh, studies that have been done in this area, and it has been found that whereas the Quran says that uh, the two waters meet, the two waters meet, uh, and between them there is a barrier that they do not uh, transgress, it uh, turns out uh, from modern studies in oceanography that indeed the fresh uh, and salt water do meet and uh, yet they do not uh, mix as if there is a barrier that uh, separates uh, the two. In fact, I saw at the Discover Islam booth uh, outside that uh, some uh, books are being given out for free entitled, uh, uh, what is it, Illustrated Guide to Islam? And I imagine they are for free, yes? If not, I'll have to pay for them now because I've already mentioned that. It's free. Um, so you, you can pick one up and, and there is a very uh, detailed uh, description and also the mentions, uh, mention of the names of uh, the scientists who have worked on this and other fields where they have shown the correspondence between modern discoveries and statements in this uh, ancient book which turns out to be still quite modern. So you can, you can pick up a copy of that.
Thank you very much for the uh, lecture. I wish I was not late today. I'm sorry, I was kind of late. But um, I have a question. I, when I was in the States, I was as exchange students over there. I heard something quite similar to what you explained. There's a miracle of Bible based on this number and this number and this number and this expl explanation is goes on and that's the why you have to be Christian. They try to convince me to be Christian. Even I was Christian by the time, anyway. Um, so I was just kind of curious the, how you distinguish yourself from those Christian people who believe they're high, not high, but uh, were sophisticated science in the Bible that some people believe. How, can, how, can, how do you distinguish yourself from those people? Yes. I understand your question. So, uh, the, Methods can be uh, misused, uh, they can be overused. And I'm familiar with uh, even attempts by Muslims to uh, prove the correspondence between things uh, of a numerical nature in the Quran itself. I've already mentioned the case of Dr. Rashad Khalifa. And in fact, he still has followers who continue along the same lines and insist on some of the same errors and uh, insist on finding correspondence between things where um, none seem to exist, but one has to go to a very far-fetched uh, sort of explanation in order to find such correspondence. So uh, I, I think I distinguish myself from such activity in, in uh, at least two basic ways. First, in that uh, we should not be obsessed with trying to find correspondence where none exists. And second, uh, and definitely so, we should not uh, twist the data in order to make uh, the data fit such conclusions. Uh, so our explanations should not be far-fetched, and uh, our explanations uh, should be based on the actual facts. So we have a text, and we are observing what is there. Uh, now, the observations which have been mentioned in, in reference to the Bible um, uh, have not uh, proven themselves satisfactory to any kind of scholarly analysis. I have in mind, for example, the work done by Michael Drosnin, in his book, uh, The Bible Code, and more recently, The Bible Code Two, And then there's a book by Jeffrey Satinover uh, on The Bible Code as well. But both uh, Drosnin and Satinover are using what is called uh, equidistant letter spacing uh, as a method of studying the Hebrew text of the Old Testament. Now, as we said before, the Hebrew text uh, does not have any vowels, just as the Arabic does not have any vowels. And what these scholars have done is that they have arranged uh, the Hebrew text in lines, they have removed all of the spaces between them, and they have then formed something like a grid that you find in, in puzzles that you can buy a book of uh, at your local uh, newsstand. You know, those puzzles where you have a, a jumble of letters and you're supposed to find words going across, going down, or going uh, obliquely. You, you know that sort of puzzle. So what they have done is that they have taken the pages of the Hebrew Bible and they have arranged it this way and then they try to find words going every which way to say if they find correspondences between words, so they find Indira up here and they find shot down here, and then they say, see, Indira was to be shot. And that was already predicted in the Hebrew Bible, uh, referring to Indira Gandhi, for example. Uh, but uh, their, their study did not um, find itself, uh, did, did not uh, become persuasive to scholars examining this, uh, because what has been found is that uh, they did not have a standard rule for working on, on how many letters you're going to put in each column. So you start out and say, okay, put 100 letters in each, in each row. So you have, that means you have 100 columns. And you look for words. If you don't find words that are familiar, then change the number of letters you're going to put in each row. So make it 80. So by snaking it differently, you can get a different combinations and more word possibilities until you get something. But then, of course, if you have no working rules and you just uh, you know, fix the, the, the columns according to what will bring you the results, well, then you don't really have uh, any uh, way of saying that, this is, that there is a plan here. You're just trying to make some plan where there is none. Moreover, there's no logic behind this to say that uh, you, you put this this way and then you're going to find words going across or down or obliquely. Uh, it seems to be a very strange way of doing it. And so many scholars who have review, reviewed this. In fact, I have uh, with me a note from the Bible Review 
magazine where some studies uh, have been reported on. And um, I'll give you an idea of um, some of the studies that uh, have been reported. Uh, one is uh, entitled The Bible Code Cracked and Crumbling uh, that appeared in the Bible Review in August 1997. Uh, and then another um, article by Shlomo St uh, Sternberg in the same uh, in the same uh, magazine. One was by Ronald uh, Hendel. And, and there are several other studies which have been reported here, but you get the idea. The biblical scholars themselves have not found that um, sort of study to be uh, of any value. And, and I'm not aware that any other studies uh, regarding numbers of things in the Bible have proven themselves to be uh, worthy of our attention. But uh, I should add that if there is anything in the Bible that corresponds to uh, the kinds of things we've been showing here tonight, uh, that uh, would not be rejected by Muslims because Muslims believe not only in the Quran, but in all of the scriptures that have been revealed through God's previous prophets, many of which are collected within the pages of the Holy Bible. So if uh, there are some parts of the Bible which prove themselves to be uh, by, there by divine revelation, that should not come as a surprise to any Muslim. Okay, I'm going with who has the mic, yeah? Okay. Bismillah ar rahman ar rahim uh, The young speaker, uh, young speaker questioner, had put a question to the respectable speaker, the honorable gentleman from Canada, Brother Shabir Ali, and we have all benefited from his uh, expertise and his... But the young, to satisfy the curiosity of the young gentleman who said that uh, how a non-Muslim should perceive whether the Quran is a miracle. So to, to that gentleman and to the whole audience, I would say that Allah is one and he alone is one. And there is no other entity in the world which is one. And Allah has said in the Quran, in one ayah, Subhan al-Lazi khalaq al kullaha. Praise be to the Lord who is one. And everything else has been created in pairs. So this is the answer for the young gentleman who who wanted to know the answer whether the Quran is a revealed book or not. And according to this, if we all in this hall, if we step out of this hall, and if we pick up the soil, we pick up the mud, we pick up the drop of water, the moisture, the moisture H2O is a combination. The air that we breathe is a combination. Everything, being a, a medical man, I'm saying this, that everything which exists, a, a cell in the heart, exist in pairs. In the eyes, you have rods and cones. In functions, even, you have flexures and extensions. That means even in the function, everything is in pairs. But only, subhanahu ta'ala, uh, uh, who is the creator of the world, he is one. Everything created. So this is a challenge of the Quran. It is an academic challenge, a silent challenge in one line. Subhana lazi khalaq al azwaja kullaha mimma tumbitul ardu wa min anfusihim. So this, I hope, will satisfy that ferrous, we have talked of iron al-hadid. There is no such thing as iron. It is either ferrous sulfate, ferrous carbonate. There is no such thing as sodium. Sodium chloride, sodium phosphate, sodium carbonate, sodium bicarbonate. There is no such thing as anything which doesn't exist as a single entity. Even the atom, we, we think it's an entity. But you have the protons and the neutrons. You have water, the air that you breathe. So this is my, not my question, it is a question, but at the same time, I am putting to the, to the Honorable Speaker that we have benefited from his expertise and I am very grateful that my knowledge, my academic knowledge has certainly been uh, increased by this. But on the side of spirituality, I would like to say and prove astronomically that the Quran is a book 1400 years ago. Is it not a fact that the, Allah said in the Quran, that the sun and the moon will collide. Now, when I was eight years old, I went to my teacher and I said, Teacher, how will the sun and moon collide? I went to my father and I said, Father, it is given in the Quran. How will the sun and moon collide? My father, respectable father, he was a barrister, graduate, and he was an alim. He could not reply to me. My teacher, honorable teachers, sheikhs, they could not reply to me. But I believed as a matter of faith. Now, to this distinct audience, I can say that the modern astronomers have proved that sometime in the future, in not near future today or tomorrow, but definitely in the future, 
the sun and the moon will collide. And this is given in the Quran, which you may shun so well from it. So this is, I, I'm not giving a talk, but I'm only trying to satisfy the curiosity of the young man. If he wants to meet me after the lecture, I should be pleased to give him not one, but many points. So thank you. Thank you. Much. Thank you very much. question and observation both. I hope the speaker will agree with me that except Allah, which is one, nothing else is one. Everything is in pairs, ladies and gents and animals and, and creations. Thank you very much. Thank you. You like to come in? Yeah, no, we have the microphone. We have one here and one here. Assalamu alaikum, brother. Assalamu alaikum. for that talk. Um, just sort of touching on slightly on what the brother was mentioning earlier on. <clears throat> the Quran says that um, uh, if you have any doubt as to the authenticity of the Quran, then produce uh, a surah like it. Now, that's a challenge to mankind. Uh, what I really wanted to know and troubled me for a while is the, uh, what criteria do you apply uh, or use to judge the actual attempt, especially when you're looking at uh, a very short surah, something like uh, Surah al Qasr, which is just a couple of lines long? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the question basically is that uh, we have in the Quran what seems to be a challenge uh, to people to produce a book like the Quran. And uh, it looks like the Quran is saying that if, if this book is not uh, humanly producible. And, not only this book, but not, in, not even one like it, or even something resembling it. Not even the book on the whole, but even one of its chapters. And we know that there are some very short chapters, such as the one the questioner asked about, Surah Al-Kawthar, a surah of the fountain. Uh, such a short uh, chapter. How could one imagine something uh, being so impossible as to produce a chapter like this one? What are then the criteria by which we might judge? And uh, the answer to that is that Muslim scholars are not uh, themselves so quite uh, agreed on, on what exactly is this challenge and, and why is it that it cannot be met. First, why cannot, can it not be met? Some have said that the Quran is so inherently miraculous the way it is put together that human beings cannot put something together like that. It is impossible at the human level. And some others have said that while it is theoretically possible at the human level, God has in fact prevented anyone he has intervened such that no one will be able to uh, do this by turning them uh, away from the very task of, of producing something like the Quran. And uh, in either case, the same objective is met, uh, that uh, the result is that uh, no one can produce something like the Quranic text, nothing to batch, match its beauty and eloquence and wisdom. Now, by saying that, I've already uh, said what are some of the things that are inherent in the Quran. But uh, what might have been uh, known as the Quran at one time, or its features as known at one time, may be different than its features as now known. In, uh, in other words, we know much more now about the Quran than people may have known at one time. Some of the things that we have described here tonight uh, would be new to some of our uh, predecessors. So at the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the challenge was understood as uh, involving two things. One is that uh, it is not possible really for, um, or it's not reasonable to suggest that a human being who is known to his contemporaries as a, hum as a wise person, as a reasonable individual, uh, as uh, a trustworthy individual whom they call al-amin and al-sadiq, the truthful and the, and the trustworthy one, for him to forge a lie on God and say that God revealed to him a book whereas in fact God had revealed nothing to him. We know that uh, even in our modern setting where people tell little white lies, there are certain th things that they would not tell us a lie. Like one might call in sick, but one wouldn't call in and say that his grandmother died. Th there are certain lies that you don't tell, um, and period. So it's for, in the situation of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, it was unimaginable that one would uh, tell a lie on God and say, God revealed something to me if in fact God had not done so. Especially for, from the, um, in the case of a person who is known to be uh, truthful and trustworthy to his contemporaries. Uh, the second uh, point to be noted about the challenge is that the Arabs at the time were uh, quite adept at uh, producing beautiful compositions in the Arabic language. Uh, this was their forte. And at the same time, uh, the Quran seems to come as a challenge to that, to show that the Quran 
is so beyond what they have produced that it is uh, um, not something that human beings can imagine as coming from another one of their contemporaries. It, the best explanation for that is that it is a revelation from the Almighty God. So it is related, for example, that there were seven masterpieces called the Malakata Saba, the seven suspended ones. These were thing, pieces of uh, compositions that were hung up in the Kaaba, the house of worship in Mecca, uh, as specimens of the best that could be produced. And when the Quran began to be recited in public, these had to be taken down because they were no match for the beauty and eloquence of the Quran. Now, standing 1400 years later, I'm going to end this now very quickly, uh, we know much more about the Quran. For example, the way the Quran has become a living reality in our own lives. It is unimaginable now that, uh, that this challenge could be met, that someone can really satisfy us that they have produced something that matches the beauty and eloquence of the Quran. And so it turns out that uh, we, we can put our faith in the Quranic text, that it is what it says it is, it is a revelation from the Almighty God, and it is an in inimitable wonder, and some of the wonder we have seen here in tonight's talk. Thank you. Actually, we are limited of time, and we only have about five minutes to go. So if we could uh, arrange very two quick questions, maybe. There's one guy who says there to have <laughs> a question. Okay, then. Um, uh, just a quick question. You now, uh, to further the uh, miracles sent down by God, um, the, the other books, such as the Injil and the Torah, uh, the miracles set in the Quran, is there any science of similar miracles, as in like saying that uh, tales are written 365 times. Is there similar you know, miracles in the Torah and the Angel uh, which relate to similar ones in the Quran? Yeah, the quick answer to that is that I'm not aware that uh, any such uh, similar things have been observed in the case of the Torah and the, and the Angel. In terms of um, science, uh, an excellent book written on this subject is uh, the one by Dr. Maurice Bouquet, a French doctor who um, began to study the Quran from the point of view of science. And he found that uh, whereas the uh, Quran mentions many things that are accurate from a modern scientific point of view and nothing inaccurate, he found, on the other hand, that uh, the previous books did not have the same feature, that uh, there were many inconsistencies and inaccuracies of a historical and scientific nature in the other, in the other texts. They've already seen in passing in today's presentation how uh, the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew's Gospel has been deliberately tailored in order to give you uh, the, the neat fit of, of three uh, uh, sets of 14 generations each, whereas in fact that was not historically accurate but uh, theologically important for the writer. Uh, so uh, we do not uh, find anything of this nature in the, in the Quranic text. In terms of numbers, I'm uh, aware of some studies that have been done to show numerical correspondences of things in the Old and New Testaments, but I'm not aware that any of these have uh, commended themselves to scholarship, and uh, they have, in fact, uh, been debunked. So in the end, it looks like the Quran alone has this uh, uh, sort of surprising feature. And uh, this, uh, there is an explanation for this uh, from the Quranic point of view. Uh, previous scriptures were sent along with prophets, and prophets came one after another. So if people did not pay attention to the scriptures after a while, there were new prophets coming to draw people's attention back to God. But in the case of the Quran, there would be no other prophet to come. The, the Quran itself had to be a lasting, living message. Now, in the case of the previous prophets, the prophets might work miracles which would draw the attention of people to the seriousness of their message and their support from God. In the case of the Quran, because the prophet is no longer around and no one to work any miracles, the message itself had to be a miracle so that people can still be infused with the message as they read it today. By reading it, they would discover the miracle itself in the message. And so the Quran turns out to be a very different book in the history of scriptural revelation. Jazakallah khair, Brother Ali, for this beautiful uh, presentation. Uh, it is already known that there are lots of many verses in Quran that uh, described in detail the development of the human embryo, as I was discussing with you yesterday. Um, I'm, obviously, I'm not trying to stretch or force this as a Muslim, but I'm just wondering, is there any, from the numerical point of view, is there anything that has analyzed these verses uh, and there are 
uh, thing that has been driven as uh, numerical miracles? Um, no, I have not um, studied this uh, from the numerical point of view, and I'm not aware that any studies have been done, done on this. So, uh, as I understand, your question is about those verses which uh, uh, are interesting from a, from a scientific point of view regarding the growth and development of the human embryo. You're asking whether any numerical studies have been done on those verses themselves, and my answer is no, I'm not aware of any that have been done. I would like to thank you all for coming to attend this lecture and also would like to extend our thanks to Sheikh Shabir for taking the time to, to uh, say the lecture and answering the questions. Uh, if you have more questions regarding this topic and the other topic that we are going to have, inshallah, tomorrow, there is a feedback form which will be uh, outside you will pick up uh, when you go out, inshallah, for the refreshments outside and, and uh, some uh, soft drinks and hot drinks there. So you can uh, just fill the forms, and if you have questions, you can just write it, and we will get back to you, inshallah. Uh, just to remind you that still we are going to have the exhibition at the main square there, and uh, it will be moved at uh, 3 o'clock. By 3 o'clock, it will be moved here to the foyer of the lecture theater to have the, the first lecture for tomorrow, which is, will start at 15 o'clock. Uh, it is about women in Islam at Lecture Theater 1. It was actually organized in Lecture Theater 2, and uh, uh, with the thanks to the university that being moved to Lecture Theater 1. And also, uh, Muslim and Christians' perception of God will start at 18, 6 p.m., and also it will be in Lecture Theater 1. So uh, uh, please come in tomorrow and... Uh, uh, highlight, highlight us uh, with your uh, attendance here. Uh, thank you very much.